I want to talk, kind of going to go back to what I did a couple of weeks ago and uh, finish up some stuff on that. I wasn't going to, but that's where the Lord took me. I was reading Genesis, and I love Genesis because there's so much in the book of Genesis. Uh, it's just crazy how much is in there. And uh, I was reading there, and some things started coming out. And there's a lot of little tidbits in there that I want to share. And don't forget these little tidbits because they add all the way through this message. But let's pray that the Holy Spirit will take this and uh, do what He wants to with it. So, Father, I thank You and I praise You for this day. I thank You for each person that is here today, Lord. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the Holy Spirit, the great teacher that leads and guides into all truth. And, Father, I just ask right now that the Holy Spirit would just move through this place, Father. Take Your Word and uh, give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and a boldness, Lord, just to apply it to our life and run with it. So, Father, I thank You for what You're doing in this church. I thank You for what You're doing in these lives. So, Lord, have Your way here today. Have Your way in our lives, Father. And we give You all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to start in Genesis chapter 3. You know, I want to read quite a bit here. But within this is, is where I'm going to springboard off of. I'm going to read Genesis 3 to pretty much all the chapter. Adam and Eve are both there. Adam was given two commands. Let me start here. Adam was given two commands. One was a command not to touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was a command that says, don't do this. And then there was another command that said, you are to guard and take care of the garden. This was what he was to do, to keep out those things that shouldn't be in there, which is only one that really shouldn't be there, and take care of the garden. He had two commandments. That's it. Only two. And so Adam and Eve now are in the garden. Stage is set. Starting in Genesis 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, this is what the serpent is saying. Now in this text it does not say that the serpent is Satan. But you can go through the rest of the Bible and it says that it is. So here we have Satan coming to Eve in the garden and says, Yea, hath God said... That is the first question in the Bible. The very first question in the Bible is Satan asking humanity, let's just say that, there's only two, asking humanity, did God really say, challenging the Word of God. And this is the same thing it is today. The world has been saying it. Science has been saying it. Higher education has been saying it. Did God really say? Is this really true? Do you think this is all real? It's the same thing. Packaged a little different, but it's the same thing. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, ye, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. There's a, there's a lie right there. Boom. There's the first lie. For God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes, and remember this, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God's. King James says God's, but in the Hebrew, it's God. Knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree was desired to make one wise. Here's all these temptations. And she took the fruit and did eat thereof. 
and gave it to her husband. He's standing right there. But I want you to see something. She ate of the fruit. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. She ate the fruit and absolutely nothing happened. Then she turns and gives it to her husband. And he eats it. And verse 7 says, And the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This is the first place in the Bible of religion. This is man's attempt to fix the problem. This is man's attempt to satisfy God by making fig leaves because they were naked. Man's attempt. This is religion. This is the very start of religion. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. This is your creator. Here comes, here comes the God of the universe. The God that made everything. The God that made me, that made Eve, that made everything. And I hear God coming. The God that knows all, can do all. Here comes God. And I'm going to go hide. Now, you know, just in a word, stupid. Stupid. But they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Do you understand when we have worship service, we, it is an attempt to enter into the presence of God? That we as humans, as children of God, we want to be in His presence. But they hid themselves from His presence. This is chapter 3 of Genesis. You can see everything is messed up, freaked out, weird in the garden now. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where are you? That's the second question in the Bible. The first question was, did God say? And the second question was God asking humanity, where are you? Now, God knows everything. He knew exactly where the location of Adam and Eve were. He knew exactly where they were. But He was asking them, where are you positionally? Where are you spiritually? Because you've fallen. You are no longer where you used to be. And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. This is the first time fear shows up in the Bible. And it's because man broke both. Let me put it this way. Man broke all of the commandments that there were. Don't eat. Take care of the garden. Broke them both. And because of their disobedience, because of the sin, their eyes were open. And they realized they were naked. The innocence of them were gone. And so what they do, man, in his attempt to please God, sewed fig leaves together and hid himself from their father. Now, as a parent, if your child was afraid of you, I don't know about you, but to me, that would hurt. That my kids were afraid of me. But Adam said, we hid ourselves because we were afraid. Fear has entered in to the human race. God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree wherein I commanded you not to do that? And the man said, the woman you gave me, she gave it to me. Here, and here, now, here's, the finger, here's where finger pointing starts. It's not my fault. It was that woman you gave me, God. 
So God looks over at Eve. Eve, what's this you've done? Well, it was the snake you created. The snake over here, he's the one that did it. And so there was a curse placed on the snake. But do you see the finger pointing? Not my fault. No one could take a responsibility. <laughs> and it wasn't me, it was her. It wasn't me, it was him. I wasn't pointing at Greg. <laughs> now, here's something I want to ask. See, this, now you're going to get into my mind. This is what I do for hours. I question this stuff. When Eve ate of the fruit, nothing happened. She hands it to Adam. He eats of the fruit, and boom, their eyes are open. Now then, a couple of questions. Was it because Adam was the head of the house, and that's why their eye, it had to be him? Can't be, because he was not the head of the house at that time. They were both equal. It wasn't until after they ate that man was put over woman. He was not the head of the house. They were equal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Man and woman equal. But because of the fall, it was changed. But see, we, are, we, we serve a God of restoration. And He is going to restore all things back to the way they were. He is going to restore everything back before the fall. Not today, and probably not tomorrow, but he will restore it all. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So why, why was it when Eve ate, nothing happened? It wasn't until Adam ate. In my opinion, it was because it took both of them because they were one flesh. And I have a feeling in a marriage, when one of the spouse in a marriage agrees with something, but the other one does not agree with something, it doesn't happen. But when they come into agreement, it happens. It takes place. And whenever, there, whenever Adam and Eve were there, and Eve ate of it and gave it to Adam, he agreed and ate it also. And that brought the fall. I literally think it took both of them to do that. I don't know what you're going to do with that piece, but that's my thinking. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life. And in verse 15 is the very first prophetic statement, very first prophecy. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. That was the first prophetic statement of a seed being born unto woman, unto Eve, later on, and they named him Jesus. And Satan tried to kill him. From all appearances, it looked like it happened on the cross, but yet three days later, he rose from the grave. And even though Satan tried to kill him, it was actually Jesus that's going to crush his head and Satan's only going to bruise his heel. That prophetic statement all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be for thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's where that happened. Not before. They were equal. And, into, and we're still equal. Don't, anyway, I don't want to get into that. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, thou hast eaten from the tree which I commanded thee, uh, saying, Thou shalt not. 
eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And on it goes, thorns and thistles and sweat of thy brow. And here's another little tidbit. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, And unto Adam also uh, and to his wife did God make coats of skins and clothe them. This is the first entrance of a blood sacrifice to cover the sin of the person. Because, see, they were covered with fig leaves, things of the ground, vegetation. God had to kill something to bring the skin and cover them with skins. There was a, had to be a blood sacrifice to cover what had happened, what took place. And the Lord God said unto the man, now you know good and evil. And they got kicked out of the garden. Verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent them forth out of the garden of Eden to till the ground. That was spiritual death. They were separated from God. That was the spiritual death. So they did die. God said you would die, and they did. Now, they didn't die until like I, don't, I can't remember now, 800, Mike, do you remember how old Adam was? 900, 800 years old before they died physically. But they died immediately spiritually. When you were born, you were spiritually dead. You were separated from God. That's why Jesus had to come. God had the problem all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And he sent Jesus 4,000 years later to fix the problem. That we who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior are covered with that blood sacrifice that has taken all sacrifices and reconciled us back to God so that we are spiritually alive. Oh, here's something else. Another little tidbit. God brings Eve to Adam. He says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. And for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and be joined one flesh unto his wife. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as odd because Adam did not have a mother and father. There were no mothers and fathers. God created him out of the dust as a man. He did not have a mother and a father. He did not have a belly button because he did not have an umbilical cord because he was not born as we are. He was created. So, therefore, he had no mother and father. But yet it says here, a man shall leave his mother and father. How did Adam know about a mother and father? This is the first hint that Adam had more going on up here than we give him credit for. In fact, I believe this is just me again. Call me crazy. Thank you. But I believe Adam and Eve could literally communicate with the animals because it did not shock Eve that the serpent was talking. It did not shock Balaam when his donkey started talking. My donkey start talking to me, I'm going to find another way out. <laughs> that's weird. But yet, that's weird to us. But I believe that when God restores everything back to the way it was, it's just my thought. I can't prove it, but I have a feeling we will be able to communicate with all of nature because I think Adam did. I think Adam was a genius. Scientists say we only use 10% of our brain. I believe Adam used all of his brain. 
I believe he had more going on than we have even thought of. He was a genius. He was brilliant. He knew things spiritually and naturally. He knew things because there was no mother and father, and yet he comes right out and says this. He knew he had more going on than what we realize. So what I want to look at is this fear thing. Fear entered in to the human race. COVID-19 shows up, the black plague shows up, cancer shows up, the threat of nuclear war shows up, uh, the fact that I bought uh, two acres of pumpkins and they cancel Halloween, and all these things, that, these calamities that can happen, we become fearful. We get scared. And it only takes a phone call, a text message, the doctor saying something, and fear strikes our heart. And yet fear is not of God. I'm talking about the fear that scares, not reverence. There is a reverence. There is a reverence to God that is referred to as fear in the Bible. I'm talking about the fear that you are scared, that you are worried, that something is wrong. And it's interesting because in Job 3.25 it says this, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Is it possible the thing that we're afraid of, that we focus on, that our heart, all of a sudden the doctor says cancer, the doctor says COVID, the doctor says this, someone says that, you hear a siren, a horn honk, and all of a sudden fear comes in there and you start thinking about that thing that you are scared of and that opens the door to bring it to pass. Job said, that thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. That thing which I was afraid of has come into my life. And if fear is not of God, then why are we afraid? Franklin Roosevelt, 1933, said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And there was so much truth in that. I don't think he realized what he was saying then. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. You know, sometimes I notice that we Christians, I'm, I'm included in this, we confess in church things that we do not possess in our character outside of church. Let me say that again for those who just woke up. Sometimes we confess here in church things that we do not possess in our character outside of church. We can say a lot of things, but then we live a whole different life out there. Don't look, don't look around at anybody. In fact, I'm going to turn this way, so. <laughs> Second Timothy 1.7 says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Let me say that again. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of power, of love, and a sound mind. And I want to look at those three things. Power. It's the Greek word dudamus, where we get our word dynamite. Simply means force. It is a force. Literally or figuratively, it's miraculous power by implication, a miracle. It's translated in the King James into these words. Ability, abundance, might, power, strength, work. Well, let's leave work off. Ability, abundance, might, power, strength, and work. That's what dudamus is. That's what the Holy Spirit. See, he didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he did give us the Holy Spirit that dwells inside us. The second word is love, simply agape. It is a brotherly love. It is a love that is unconditional. That's the love God has for us. 
is an agape love. That he loves you no matter what. He doesn't care what you have done or what you're going to do. He loves you. Let me ask you a question. When he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, did he love them? Yes. Absolutely. And you know why? He had to kick them out of the garden because if they ate of the tree of life, they would live forever in that condition. And he separated them, not only from him who was a just and holy God, he separated that, but he protected the way of the tree of life because that tree was what Jesus hung on 4,000 years later that brought us life, that not only brought us life, but cleansed us of all sin. Sound mind. I noticed a lot of you perked up when I said that. <laughs> I can't pronounce the Greek word. It's about yay long. It starts with an S. <laughs> I don't know. And here's what it means. Now, sound mind, you would think, well, it would mean that I'm not crazy and I'm not schizophrenic and I'm not uh, catatonic and I'm not uh, bipolar and I'm not. No. It means discipline, self-control. Oh, there's that word, self-control. What is one of the fruits of the Spirit? Self-control. And it comes from a root word that means to teach, to be sober. And if you remember the teaching that I've done before, that we have to be sober-minded. That if you take too much of the world into your life, you become intoxicated on the things of the world. And God says, don't become intoxicated on those things that you are to be sober-minded. Sound mind. God has given us a spirit that has given us power, that has given us love, and that has made us self-disciplined, full control of ourself, supposed to. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, but not therefore so that we can, will not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. But we can be partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The afflictions, you want to you wanna live for God? You're going to suffer afflictions. But it's not to be feared. It's not to be feared. He did not give us a spirit of fear. So whatever the world brings, whatever the government does, whatever, whatever disease and calamity comes, we should not be fearful because we have power, love, and a sound mind. In Ephesians 1.17, I've got quite a few scriptures today. In Ephesians 1.17, it says, The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. What happened to Adam back in the garden? His eyes were opened to good and evil. They knew they were naked. Their eyes were open. Now he says, I want your eyes to be enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities nor powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God.
Now I'm about done, maybe. I may be lying, I don't know. Whosoever shall confess Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and him in God. And we know and believe the love of God hath that he's given us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. There's no room for fear. Herein, herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. <gasps> A day of judgment? Yeah, we can have boldness because you will not be judged. In the day of judgment, you as Christians will not be judged. Your works will be judged, but you won't be. That's why we can have boldness. Because of the love of God in Christ Jesus for you. We will not stand in judgment. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Let me talk. Perfect, 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 perfect love casts out fear. And I've said this before, as much as I love my wife, and I love her with all my heart, it is not a perfect love. As much as she loves me, and she better love me. <laughs> or she will stand in judgment. <laughs> but we do not have perfect love for each other. So how can I have perfect love that casts out fear? It's by having the eyes of our understanding open that it's not my love that's perfect. It is His love toward me that is perfect. That no matter what I have done or what I will do or how, how wormy I feel, He loves me with a perfect love, an unconditional love. And that's what it is for each one of us that are in Christ Jesus. That that love that is so perfect in God that He loves you what in the world do I have to fear? When the God of the universe, I don't have to hide anymore. Adam went and hid himself. We don't have to hide. I am not ashamed. My sins are gone. My God who loves me has taken away everything and I don't have to worry about the judgment because I will not stand in judgment because of what Jesus did on the cross. And one of these days, the God of restoration will restore all things. We read how, how he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And all of this nonsense in this world is going to be gone. That Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. And we will not see him. We will not be tempted by him. And we will rule and reign with Jesus forever and ever. And that's the ball game right there. That's the ball game. So what do I have to fear? What do I have to fear? And we get scared over some of the craziest little stupid stuff that stop us from going forward, that stop us from doing what we're called to do. Even sharing Jesus, even, even the fear of sharing Jesus because of what people may think. Dear Lord, you're bringing them life you're, you're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you're bringing that to them. They should be ashamed when they hear it, instead of you being ashamed for trying to share it. Right. And I'm not saying that you've got to, well, today at 2 o'clock, I'm going to go out on the street, and I'm going to find somebody, and I'm going to, you don't have to do that. If you have a willing heart to share Jesus, I promise you this. He will open a door for you and put people in your path that you can share with that is hungry to hear the gospel. 
You just have to have a willing heart and say, yes, Lord, use me. And he'll open doors. He will, he will make things happen that you couldn't do on your own. And he'll bring it right to you. And it's all you have to do then is boldly share Jesus, the King of Kings. Share life with him. And we should have nothing to fear. Absolutely nothing to fear. And you know, I, I, I go back and I think here again of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here the king, the one that has all power, that has the, has the rule, has the say, that sets the laws, and says, you will bow down and worship. And they said, no, we will not. He says, I will throw you guys in a fiery furnace. I will burn you to a crisp if you don't bow down. Well, so be it. Our God is God, and he's the one we serve. He's the one we bow to. And if he lets us die, then so be it. But if not, he will save us. Fire up the furnace. And they got it seven times hotter than normal and threw them in there, bound Ropes tied to their hands and feet and threw them in there. The people that threw them in died. It was so hot that the people that threw them in the fire died. But the king stands over and looks in there and says, Did we not? Didn't, didn't we just throw three people in there? Everyone said, Yes, O king. I see four people bound, unbound, I mean, and walking around, and the one appears like the Son of God. Amen. And they walked out of that fiery furnace with the ropes burnt off of them, but they didn't even smell of smoke. Amen. Now that's pretty incredible. Amen. And if that is the God we serve, what do we have to fear? Right. What do we have to fear? And as Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself because his perfect love, when we understand that perfect love, when the eyes of our understanding are open and we understand that love, it will cast out all fear. And we have nothing, nothing to fear. And what's cool about the book of Genesis, all those things started back there. The first question, the first pro prophetic, the first sin, the first fear, the first act of religion, all of that. But you go to the book of Revelation and read that. And you see that sin is done away with. Religion's done away with. Satan's done away with. All that stuff that was wrong there in Revelation at the end, it's all done away with. Hallelujah. See, one of these days... There will be a new heaven, and there will be a new earth. And those of us who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior will rule and reign with Him forever in a place where there's no sin, no fear, no sorrow, no tears, everlasting joy, perfect peace, perfect harmony, perfect unity, and none of this will even be remembered all because of Jesus all because of Jesus what a great God we serve what a, oh, that'd be a good place for an amen what a great God we serve hallelujah stand to your feet